So here we are, week number two in our series, and we're going to start right off in Ephesians 5. If you have your Bible, feel free to grab your Bible, and yeah, let's go to Ephesians 5. If you do not, you can, it'll be on the screen for you. You can follow on the screen. Some important and very popular verses when it comes to marriage. Ephesians 5, starting with verse 22, says, Wives, submit to your husbands, as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. And you can jump down to verse 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Two very important, significant verses for us as we look at marriage. And we'll look, we'll unpack that just a little bit as we go forward. But you know, wives submit to your husbands is how it starts. And so what that doesn't mean is that you have to do everything they tell you to do. That they are the, that whatever they say, that's the way, you know. And, and, you know, if guys were honest, we'd be like, man, we wish that was it. That'd be great. That's awesome. Hey, it's right there in the Bible. Submit right now. Whatever I say, you know, I, make, I get to make all the decisions, but that's not what the case is. Uh, but what it does mean is that you need to allow your husband to lead. Allow him to lead the way in, in your relationship and in your family. We'll talk about that as we go forward here this morning. And so I want to start off by just reiterating a couple of thoughts that I had last week, and that is towards the single people. Because so I really meant what I said. I really want this to be a place where even if you're single, you feel valued at this church. That just because you don't have a significant other doesn't mean that you have less value. And so as we go through this series I believe that even the single people are going to learn some stuff out of this. You're going to learn even just relational principles that you can apply to any relationship as we talk about the marriage relationship. It'll help even in your coworker relationship. So there's things that you're going to glean from this. And uh, if you're hoping to be married someday, I pray that God gives you a vision of the marriage that he wants you to have, that, that you can have. So I pray that God ignites vision for a healthy, strong, vibrant marriage someday. That's, that's my prayer. That's my hope. Uh, but again, Remember this, our value doesn't come from a significant other, it comes from God. Okay? So every week we're looking at this statement, my marriage is, it's this hashtag that we, that we came up with. Hashtag my marriage is blank. And so you can fill in that blank. You know, what would that blank be for you? I thought I'd have some fun with that sentence this last week, and I typed it into Google. You ever type something to Google just to see what Google will say? Just like, I'm just curious, what, what is this? You know, and so I, I typed in my marriage is, and I stopped right there, and it gave me four options. This is interesting. So here's the four options it gave me. Boring, broken, over, and ending. I was so depressed. I thought, that's horrible. Like, people type this into Google, and that's how they finish it. Those are the four options it gave me. It didn't say awesome. It didn't say vibrant or fun. It said boring, broken, over, and ending. I thought, oh, Lord, help us. I guess this is just an indicator of where our culture, where our country is at when it comes to how we feel about marriage, and, and uh, apparently people are going to Google for advice as their marriage is ending. So, uh, you know, this, this week as we look at this sentence, my marriage is, the two options are controlling or empowering. Look at two, these two different things. Would controlling describe your marriage or would empowering describe your marriage? So, we kick this off. Ladies, I'd like to ask you a question. This is okay. I'd like to, I'd like to ask you an honest question. How many of you would say that sometimes you really struggle when things don't go your way because you really want things to go the way you want them? You like the things to be how you want them to be. Maybe sometimes, occasionally, you can be a little bit controlling. Anybody? Okay. Okay. No hands. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. A couple. Okay. A couple. Just like I'll just be real. That's me. That's me. Hey, don't okay. forget the That's men. Me. Sometimes men. Yeah, okay, I won't can forget the men. Way. I won't forget the men. Okay. Trust me. <laughs> so, men, got a question for you. <laughs> Maybe you can be aggressive when it comes to work and hobbies, but. How many of you would admit that occasionally maybe you can be a little bit lackadaisical when it comes to your home life? Maybe you can be a little bit um, too easygoing and you can be too passive when it comes to the important things like your home and your family. Anyone would like to say that it can be me, okay? And if, uh, you know, if, if your spouse is that and he's not raising his hand then, and you like to be controlling, ladies, feel free just to grab his hand and lift it up right now, okay? Okay. <laughs> 
All right, we have fun with that, all right? So today, we're going to talk about this, and we're going to look at a bad marriage in the Bible. This is going to be fun. You know, maybe you think your marriage is bad. This one might make you feel good about your marriage. <laughs> uh, this is going to be the marriage of King Ahab and Jezebel. So we're going to go to 1 Kings chapter 21. Feel free to turn there right now. King Ahab and Jezebel. Now, King Ahab, this is what we know about him. He is... He was the seventh king of the northern kingdom of Israel. He ruled for about 20 years as the king of the northern kingdom uh, from 875 to 855 B.C. King Ahab was a strong military and political leader. So he was a go-getter in certain areas of his life as a leader, but like is the case too often, he was a little bit passive at home. Now, as the king... He could have been one of those kings that led people closer to God because that was part of the role of the king is to lead them towards God. But unfortunately, he led the people of God away from God. He allowed idol worship. He allowed calf worship. Okay, then he got married to Jezebel and things got worse. He led the, you know, the, the people of God away from the one true God and they got into more idolatry and into Baal worship. In fact, the Bible even says this about King Ahab, it says that he... He did more evil than all the kings that came before him. But he didn't do it alone. And so we're going to look at how this happened in his life. Okay, so 1 Kings chapter 21. Let's look at verse 25 first. Verse 25 says this. Okay, so here's a, here's a synopsis of King Ahab. There was never a man like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel, his wife. As we look at this story here, Ahab represents the passive spouse, while Jezebel represents the controlling spouse. Okay, so let's first take a look at Ahab. Okay, we'll look at Ahab as the passive one. Now, we say spouse because, you know, the the passive one isn't always the man. Okay, now let's be real. Generally speaking, it usually is. Okay, most of the times, if there's a passive one and a controlling one, the man can be passive and the woman can be controlling. Okay, so those are generalizations, but they're true generalizations. So, but we still say spouse, okay, just because it can it still can go either way. So Ahab represents the passive spouse, Jezebel represents the controlling spouse. And so jump back in chapter 21 to verse 2. We're going to look at a few verses here in chapter 21, verse 2. It says Ahab said to Naboth, "Let me have your vineyard to use for a vegetable garden since it is close to my palace." In exchange, I will give you a better vineyard, or if you prefer, I will pay you whatever it's worth. But Naboth replied, The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. So Ahab went home, sullen and angry, because Naboth, the Jezreelite, had said, I will not give you my inheritance of my fathers. I'm just kind of picturing that's how he probably heard it in his mind, because he's pouting. Okay, catch this, right? He's... uh, he said, it says this at the end of verse 4. He lay on his bed, sulking, and refused to eat. Okay, he's throwing a fit. Okay, so how did that, how did this little section start here? Did you catch uh, the reason Ahab wanted to buy this piece of property? He wanted to put in a vegetable garden. Apparently, King Ahab is into vegetable gardens. And there's some dudes that will look at him and say, uh, dude, you're losing man points over the, the vegetable garden thing, okay? But if we're honest... I think every guy has at least one chick thing, and that's okay. I, I feel like it's okay for every guy to have one chick thing, okay? <laughs> you probably have a chick thing. I got a chick thing, okay? There's some guys that are into candles. They love the fragrances of candles. That's their chick thing, okay? That's fine. It's their chick thing. There's some guys that love to shop. That's their chick thing. There's some guys that are way into their hair, and they got, so, they got more product than their, than their spouse, than their wife. Uh, there's, you know, there's, there's different chick things. Can I, can I just be honest about my chick thing? I happen to like most chick flicks, especially, especially Pride and Prejudice. I really, really like Pride and Prejudice. Okay, I, I love that movie. Can I be honest? I also really like musicals. Okay, this is this is my chick thing here. Okay, I love musicals. I love uh, Les Mis Raw. Um, I love Phantom of the Opera. Phantom of the Opera was good. Uh, I love La La Land. That was great. Okay, so musical. So I just like those, and I'll be honest, I do tear up at those things, okay? All and right, he so does that's use my... a lot of product in his hair. No, I don't do that. That's my chick thing. 
Okay, so everyone, every guy is entitled to one chick thing. If you have too many, then you want to be careful, guys, all right? So King Ahab, apparently, his chick thing is a veggie garden. That's what he's into. All right, that's, that's fine. That's cool, King Ahab. All right. So he wants to build a veggie garden, but Naboth won't let him. Naboth is like, this is my inheritance. I'm not going to give up my inheritance. I, 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 this is from the family. And so Ahab is so ticked off by this that he walks away. Maybe he runs away. He throws a fit. He's crying. He's pouting. He's laying in bed, refusing to eat. He's acting like a little child. It's kind of like the little boy in the playground that, like, you know, they're, they're using his ball, but they won't listen to his rules, and they won't let him win. And so he's like, I'm going to take my ball. I'm going to go home. I'm going to play with you guys. You know, that's, that's how King Ahab is responding. But if we're honest, even as adults, sometimes we can respond a little childish like that. That's what Ahab is doing. Uh, we can do the same thing. And as men, oftentimes we feel like giving up, and we'll walk away when we feel like or we know we can't succeed at something. If I'm not going to succeed at this, then, then, then I'm out. I'm going to check out. And when it comes to marriage, this is how a lot of men feel. And this is what leads them to be a little bit passive. They feel like, I can't, I can't measure up. I'm not going to succeed at this according to her version of success, so I'm just going to check out. I'm never going to measure up to her desires and wishes for me. I'm never going to be like her, her father. And so because of this, a lot of guys will, will check out, they'll shut down, and they'll become passive. And I've seen this happen way too many times. I, I myself ha- have done this as well in certain times where I just kind of get really passive and not step in and lead like I should. Now, before Amy dives into this next se- section of the story, uh, I just want to say something to you ladies. Something you probably already know. This is something that, guys, we don't like to admit, but it's true. We can, at certain times in our life, feel very insecure. Now, all of us deal with insecurities all the time, okay, to to one level or another, but there are certain times where we can feel very, very insecure. And oftentimes when we're really trying to be strong and be tough, those are the moments where we're probably feeling the most insecure. You can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and see this is, this is the case for men and how, how really we as men, we, we need that, that spouse, that, that, that helpmate. You know, as God made everything in the beginning, he made, you know, all the, the plants. and said, that's good. You know, he made all the animals, that's good. Stars and heavens, all that, that's all good. But what he said wasn't good was that man was alone. Man needed a helper, so God gave man a woman, and, and she was his helper. She was his, his helpmate what's called. So this is an important God-given role for the woman to be the, the helpmate. This doesn't have anything to do with who's more important. This isn't a sexist thing, okay? It's just a God-designed way for us to live life. And so women, you need to understand this, that you have the power to make or break your husband. You have that power and that ability by how you treat them. And so those of you that are wives, you understand that the way you treat your husband greatly affects him you can make a man who's already weak, because let's be real, we're all weak, okay? But you can take a man who's already weak, and you can help him be stronger based upon how you treat him. Or you can make the weak man weaker based upon how you treat him. And so Amy's going to address this as we take a look at Jezebel, who represents a controlling spouse. Well, good morning. I'm glad good morning. I hope, is my mic, can you guys hear me? Oh, good. I might get a little distracted because Tyrone's looking extra fine in his striped socks, and that distracts me. But um, I get the chance to talk about Jezebel, which at first I was like, ah, man, how many women in the church get accused of being Jezebel, right? You know, we, we relate her with promiscuity, promiscuity. Everybody say it for me, promiscuity. Um, you know, a lot of times um, women with leadership giftings get called Jezebel, and it's not really because she's like Jezebel. And so I really was thinking, I wanted to break down what does Jezebel really represent or if you've been in church for a long time, if you're new to church and you've never heard this term, it's called the Jezebel spirit. We say that, oh, that girl's got the Jezebel spirit on her, right? You know, I don't know if you've heard that before, but I really want to break down the Jezebel spirit. And I want to talk a little bit about Jezebel as a person, as a human being. Um, but Je- the Jezebel spirit is not just a woman thing, actually. It's a guy thing. 
and it isn't just tied to promiscuity. In fact, I want to break down some of the ways that, that someone who struggles, which we all struggle a little bit with the Jezebel spirit at times. It's a controlling spirit. Uh, but the way that we think when we're struggling with the Jezebel spirit, when we think that we're the only one that's reliable um, at our workplace or at our home or that our marriage is basically staying together just because of us, you might be struggling a little bit with the Jezebel spirit. You know, if, they, if you have a certain way of doing things and you think that that's the only way they should be done, none of you in here, and not me, I never think that way, right? No. Then, then and you're unhappy when it's not done the way you think it should be done, um, that would be an indicator of the Jezebel spirit. You know, and a lot of times someone with the Jezebel spirit, they're going to struggle with trusting people. Not just trusting in the deep, deep, like hard stuff, important stuff, but trusting in the small things like how the chairs are lined up or how things are folded or how things are put away. Um, and they don't just struggle with, with their spouse. They struggle trusting other people oftentimes. And we're going to break down why, why that is. And, and part of that is that people don't meet their expectations. They don't do things the way that they think they should be done. And the truth is that when you struggle with the Jezebel spirit, Basically, you're struggling with fear when you're not in control. You're afraid. And so you feel much better when you're in control. But when somebody else is in control, it's like, oh, how is this going to get done? How is it going to work? And so that is really sums up kind of what you think and how you feel when you're struggling with the Jezebel spirit. Now, I was looking up Jezebel's name, and it's really interesting because her name is actually a chant that they used to worship Baal with or Baal. I don't know if I say it. Baal with. Um, and it literally means, where is my prince? Everybody say that. Where is my prince? And they chant that out. But I was thinking about it. I thought it seemed so fitting. Where is my prince? How many of you ladies have been in your house and you cannot find your husband? I can't tell you how many times. I'm like, where could he be? I mean, there's only so many rooms in this house. And um, if I'm completely transparent, he's going to kill me. Uh, we say, where is our prince? And he's usually on his throne. I'm doing, I'm doing yard work. I'm in the backyard doing <laughs> right? yard work. He, our prince, we find our prince most often on the throne reading something or playing games on his iPhone. <laughs> right? But that is what her name means. And I want to break down a few things because she's a human being. And there's a reason that she became so controlling. She didn't come out of the womb as an evil person. She didn't come out like that. In fact, she was shaped that way. And she was a princess, um, her dad was a king, and she was basically packed off and sold to the highest bidder. And she faced major rejection from her dad because she was used as a pawn for their kingdom to gain greater wealth and position and prestige. So the amount of rejection that she felt from her father, I can't even imagine. Um, but also, she had no choice over her future. She didn't get to decide who she was going to marry. She was told who she was going to marry. And so I, in some ways, can understand why Jezebel, once she was married and had some freedom, became extra controlling. She was self-protecting. In fact, Jezebel's crime wasn't that she had leadership skills, and it wasn't that she um, took charge and had a take-charge attitude. It was really that she used her influence to serve herself instead of others. And in this passage, we're going to go through 1 Kings 21, 5 through 7. It looks like she's trying to help Ahab, right? But she's not trying to help Ahab. What she's trying to do is protect herself. And basically, she's trading in the good that God has for her for a counterfeit of a sense of safety. She's trying to create it for herself. But in the end, what she does is she causes her own harm. She brings about her own death. And you can read further in that. We're not going to go that go that direction today, but you can read further in 1 Kings. She brings about her own death, and the dogs eat her, literally. Uh, but she also causes harm for those closest around her and ultimately the nation of Israel out of her own desire for self-protectionism. So go ahead and turn to 1 Kings 21, 5 through 7. We're going to read that really quick, and we're going to talk about two things that a controlling spouse does. Because, again, it's not just a woman thing. A uh, controlling spouse can be a man as well. So 1 Kings 21, 5. His wife Jezebel came in and asked him, Why are you so sullen? Why don't you eat? He answered her, Because I said to Naboth the Jezreelite, Sell me your vineyard. 
or I'll give you another vineyard in its place. But he said, I will not, I will not give you my vineyard. Jezebel, his wife, said, is this how the king of Israel acts? Get up and eat. Cheer up. I'll get you that vineyard uh, from Naboth, the Jezreelite. And really what she's saying is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take charge. I'm going to do this. So, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But two things a controlling spouse does. Number one, she belittles her husband with her words. A controlling spouse belittles their spouse with their own words. And you see that in verse 7. She says, is this how the king of Israel acts? I guarantee that that was not a compliment. In other words, she's saying, you idiot, what do you think? Kings don't act like this. And what you say to your spouse, it either builds them up or it tears them down. And so often they are becoming the very things that we're speaking over them. Our words have power. Now, Tyrone blesses me, and I wanted to highlight this because he talks very positively, and I'm so grateful. Obviously, we're not perfect at this, but there's so many times when I meet someone new, and they're like, oh, I already met your husband. He says you're a fantastic preacher, or you're an amazing wife, or you're a great minister, or you're a leader in your own right. And whenever I hear that, I think, wow, you know, he didn't say it in front of me, but this is what he really thinks of me. And instantly, I go from here to up here in confidence. Because the person I live with that I know better than anybody is speaking these positive things over me. So positive words, they go far. And again, like I said, we're not perfect. We're not always praising each other. And actually, I'm, I'm pretty acutely aware of how much my talk and my speech and my tone affect my entire household. I mean, I don't know if if you've experienced this before, but, you know, one irritated moment and all of a sudden, like, the fun in my house is, like, sucked it's like, it's gone, right? But, but one of the gifts, one of the greatest gifts I can give Tyrone is to encourage him to be his biggest cheerleader. And I've watched as his entire countenance has changed when I praise him. I can see him be lifted. Now, he likes to pretend that he doesn't need it because that's what men do. I'm just going to say, they act like they don't need it. They might even tell you they don't need it. Here, I have to pause. There we go. This huge hair in my face. I'm like, I can't see you now. I found it. (laughs) But the men, they like to act like they don't need it. And Tyrone does that. He certainly acts like he doesn't need the praise. But I'm telling you, the positive effects and even the effects of the lack of praise are too obvious for me to ignore. They do make a difference. They make a difference in his life and they make a difference in mine. And you know, one of the most common things that I hear from Christian wives. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this. He just doesn't lead me spiritually. He just doesn't measure up spiritually. You know, positive motivation is so much more powerful than negative speech. Positive motivation lifts us up. It makes us want to do better. Negative speech defeats us. It causes us to give up, to say, oh, Tyrone even said it. I'm done. I can't fulfill what you think what you, I can't fulfill what you want. And Tyrone said this already, a godly woman will make a weak man stronger, but a controlling woman will make a weak man weaker. No man ever crawled out from underneath the complaining of his wife to be better. I'm just going to say it one more time. It's true. Did you hear that? No man has ever crawled out of the constant complaining of his wife to be a better man even if what she's saying is 100% accurate and true. You see, our role as our, in, in our spouse's life is an incredible role, and it is the role of encouragement. We're called to speak encouragement over them. Basically, we're speaking to existence. We're prophesying the preferred future that God has for them over their life, even if we don't see them acting like it. And isn't that kind of what we do during dating I mean, really, we meet the guy or we meet the girl, and we're like, I could see you being a great husband. I could see you being a great uh, dad. I could see you being a great minister or a great businessman. But all of a sudden, we get married, and that just flies out the window. Like, okay, now you have to be that. The ring's on my finger, so you have to be that. And if you aren't that, then you're not good enough. But we need to continue to speak that preferred future over them, even when we do not see that. Proverbs says in 1821, that life and death is in the tongue. 
And Tyrone brought this to my attention. I had never read it before in the message. But it says, words kill and words give life. This is the same verse in the message. Words kill and words give life. They're either poison or they're fruit. You choose. It's such a good way to put that. And sadly, the controlling spouse, and and in this case, the controlling wife, tears down her husband and prophesies into existence the very negative things that she's speaking. And number two, a second way that a controlling spouse makes a weak person weaker is they just simply take over. And that's really what Jezebel does, and you see that in in verse 7. I'll get you that vineyard. Jezebel basically says, I'll get in the driver's seat. I know how to do this. She's like, you're a loser. I can get that vineyard for you, and I can do it better, too. I know none of you have ever thought that before, (laughs) right? So let's talk about the driver's seat for a minute. There are two seats in a car, right? There is the there is the passenger or the responsible seat and the carefree seat. Sorry, my I told you Tyrone socks they distract me. Um, there is the the responsible seat and then there's the carefree seat. Which seat is the responsible seat? The driver's seat. Yes. And what what does the driver do? They pay attention. They watch the signals. They know where they're going. And that's why Tyrone drives most of the time, because 90% of the time I don't know where I'm going. Can I get my directionally challenged people to raise their hands, please? (laughs) Nobody's going to admit that. Nobody's directionally challenged. I'm directionally challenged. I'm okay. So I'm the person oftentimes riding shotgun. And what does the person riding shotgun do? Change the radio, uh, have their drink ready, have fun, chill out. And that is because they are not driving, so they get to be free. Now, ladies, when we desire our husbands to sit in the driver's seat, that means we can't be sitting there, too. There can only be one driver. (laughs) Otherwise, we're going to have problems. (laughs) Now, in the UK, that driver's sitting on the other side, but that doesn't matter. They're still the driver. It still counts. But if we continue to fight for that seat, what we're doing is just causing our spouse to give up. And eventually, what they're going to say is, you know what, maybe I can't really lead them. They're going to believe. Maybe I'm not good enough. And they're just going to give that seat up to you. And they're going to take the chill seat, which is part of the biggest frustration that women have with their husbands. They just take the chill seat in disciplining the children, in schoolwork of the children, in finances, in cleaning, and in chores, in devotionals, in the spiritual life of the household, because they just don't feel like they can lead you spiritually. Period. If we constantly step into God's given role to our spouse, to our husband, we're taking it, God's plan away from his life. We're basically cutting him out from the knees. And the very thing that we desire the most, which is that our husband will lead, we're throwing it away with our own two hands. And I'm not saying I'm perfect at this. In fact, one of the things I want to talk about today is, is how we do cut our spouse off at the knee. And I already used that verbiage, but we basically cut them off at the knee when we just do it for them or we just redo it. So we can do it for them, or we can redo what they've already done. How many of you have ever had somebody redo what you've already done before? It really sucks. I'm not going to lie. I always feel sort of like a failure uh, when that happens. But that's one thing that we struggle with. And I know um, nobody in here ever does that. I never redo things Tyrone does, right? I always let them be. And maybe this is in regards to vacuuming the house. I know when Tyrone vacuums the house, I never bite his head off because there's still crumbs on the floor, right? And when I bite his head off, you know, he's probably not going to vacuum next week for me, right? Or how about loading the dishwasher? I don't know about you, but I feel like there are certain things that go on the top rack and there are certain things that go on the bottom rack, and you do not mix the two, right? I'm going to be real honest about something. (laughs) I'm real particular about how my towels are folded. Anybody else? Am I the only person? There is a way to fold towels, people. There's a way. <laughs> but here's the thing. If I want him to help up, help out and he's starting to serve and he doesn't do it the way I think it should be done and I come in and redo it for him, you think he's going to fold the towels ever again? No. Nope. No. <laughs> And Tyrone makes the bed every, every morning. Everybody give him a hand. He does. 
He makes the bed every morning, which is amazing. Um, but one thing about Tyrone is that he is not, he's got a lot of things. But he's not real good with household chores and cleaning. That's just he, not his forte. And I'm okay with that. But I'm really grateful that he makes the bed every morning. I'm not saying that the bed looks like I like it to look, where the pillows are perfectly quaffed and, and all the, all the, I have a specific way that I even tuck in my sheets. My mom taught me, you know, everything's tucked in. But when I walk by it and that bed is made, I know that Tyrone loves me. And I want to thank him for that and not be constantly upset that it isn't exactly how I want it to be. Now, I do want to say here that there are women in this room that do not have a controlling nature, but they are and do have leadership abilities. And they're driven, and that's okay. They're an A-type personality. And I kind of like that kind of lady because that's the kind of lady I am. And that's the way that God has made me. That does not mean that I have a Jezebel spirit because I'm a leader. Um, however, I have to make the choice to trust my spouse and also not take over the things that he is doing, partly because I want him to do that for me. I don't want him to step in and take over the things that I'm leading. If I'm always in control, he is going to be riding in the passenger seat in a lot of areas that I want him to be the leader in, honestly. And now I would even say to you that I sit in the driver's seat in some areas of our marriage, not because Tyrone is, not because Tyrone is passive, but actually because these are things that we've agreed upon. But ultimately, I cannot take control of the things that we've agreed upon that he's in control of. Also, when he chooses to serve our family, I cannot degrade his effort. That's just going to break him. If you struggle with control uh, in your marriage or in your workplace, maybe you're like me, I want to encourage you to pray. Pray. You know what? Usually we encourage you to pray, pray for other people. I want you to pray for you. Pray that the Lord delivers you from a controlling spirit, that he delivers you from a lack of trust, that he delivers you from fear. Pray that God changes your heart and pray for your spouse, that God encourages, empowers your spouse and pray that the Lord gives you eyes to see the preferred future that your spouse has and then stay out of the way. Even if they mess up, let them learn. Let them grow. Let them have that chance. Let them have the chance to ask you for help if they want to. You don't have to make your spouse more like you. You don't have to change your spouse and turn them into what you want them to be. Because you know what? You didn't fall in love with that. You fell in love with them. You got to expect. Ex you got to accept them for who they are. So you pray and you let God do the work He needs to do. I'm telling you, though, it can, be, it can be very tough, and I acknowledge that. It can take several years for, for change to happen, and that's okay. It's not an instant fix. Prayer is not always an instant fix. It's something that God does over time in your life and in theirs. But pray and let God, who's the only one that can change their heart and yours, and let him do the work that only he can do. So pray and stay out of the way. You know, I uh, appreciate how Amy has really worked on and grown in those areas. It's really blessed our marriage and our relationship. And, uh, you know, if I, if I were honest, I can be both of these people in this story. I can be very, uh, very controlling, but also I can be very passive. And um, that's something I just got to pay attention to in my life personally. Now, I think about Jezebel. She, she, she's controlling. She's taking over. I wonder if, if she felt like she had to. I wonder, if, I wonder if Ahab has been kind of passive around the home and hadn't done stuff, so she felt like, I need to step in and control these things and, and take charge because he's not doing it. But can I just say to the guys, we have been given responsibility to lead. God has charged us with that. It's, it's something we see clearly in, in Scripture. Man is under the authority of Christ. And a woman is under the authority of man. And again, that's not a who's more important thing. It's, it's not a power issue. It's just a position issue. It's what it is. It's how God has set this thing up, how he sets the family up. And so he's hardwired men to lead. So men, it's in you. Let me encourage you to, to lead, to, to step up and do what God has called you to do and, how, and, and who he's created you to be. And that is, that is a leader. And so there's three things I want to hit here 
won't take long on this, but three, three ways that he's called the husband to lead. He's called us to lead. Number one is the provider. We're called to lead as a provider. That doesn't mean that, uh, that women can't work and that the only expectation for you women is that you're barefoot and pregnant and you've got to stay home all day. Okay? That's not what it means. Obviously, women can work and make money. Yeah, that's, that's great, okay? It doesn't mean that also, men, you have to manage the finances, okay? If you're not good at managing the finances and working through the budget, and she is, let her do it, okay? What it does mean is that we as men have to set the tone uh, financially in our home, okay? We've got to make sure that we look at finances and money from a biblical perspective and from an eternal perspective, that, that we would say, say to our family, hey, we're going we're gonna to honor God with how we view money, okay? We're going to be a tithing family. We're going to be generous, okay? We're not going to let this be a God in our life and in, in our home. So we got to set the, the financial tone uh, of our family. And let's be real, as we bring stability and health financially, it really helps the females. They like that financial stability. They thrive in that. So you may never be wealthy, and that's totally fine, but you can be stable and you can be healthy. And uh, the truth is this, guys, when, when we honor God, when our family honors God financially, God will bless us and God will take care of us. So provider. Number two is protector. We're called to protect. Okay, this doesn't just mean if someone breaks into your home, grab your gun and protect your family, although that's part of it, right? I don't have a gun. I have a, I have a bat. I've got two bats. Okay, that's, that's, that's what I do. I grab the bat and I'm ready to go, right? That's, that's part of it, but it's, it's more than just that type of protection. It's we're called as men to protect our wife's heart and protect her emotions. She needs to know that no matter what, we're going to be there for her. We're going to love her. We're going to be faithful to her. We're going to protect her in that way. We want to protect our kids. Everyone a part of our home, okay? You know, that means maybe we've got to step in if there's things influencing our kids that aren't good for them, whether it's media or it's friends. You know, sorry, you can't go to so-and-so's house, I, and, and, and here's why. I, I need to protect you. I don't think that's a good influence on you. So, we got to protect our kids. And that's, this is a scary thing because we live in a scary world. Uh, it's like you hear this more and more and more and more. Man, it's, it, it's kind of scary to bring kids into the world these days because of all the things going on. But this is an important role for us. Obviously, both parents are to protect. But, man, we've got to lead the way in this. And then the third one is this. We're called to pastor. To pastor our family. Now, this is the one that can be intimidating. And I'll be honest, I know it's intimidating because I, I feel it personally. I have felt overwhelmed and insecure when it comes to this, which is kind of funny because I'm a pastor. It's like my job. But when, honestly, when it comes to be pastoring my family and, and Amy and my kids, I didn't know how to do it, so I felt very insecure. How can I pastor people and talk and teach and preach and all this, but I, I struggle at home? And so I've had to work through that. I've had to push through that. I've had to ask people for help. I would encourage you to do the same thing. Push through the awkwardness of it. Just step out and try things. If you need ideas, talk to somebody. Ask people for, for help. But uh, God has called you to be the priest of the home. We are called to pastor our home. Okay? You don't have to be a really smart theologian and have two-hour exegetical teachings to your family on Leviticus every single day. Okay? That's, that's, that's not what's expected here. Okay? You, you, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to know a lot, but just lead the way. And, and simply even having spiritual conversations. As you get together you know, over a meal, talk about God. Talk about, you know, how did you see God today in your life? Just open up the conversation spiritually. Take time to pray together as a family, even if it's just to, to pray over the meal and thank God for the blessings that he's given you. I mean, just take, take time and take initiative to step in and lead the way, guys. Can I encourage you with that? I, I think partnering with the church is so important, too. If you got kids, you get to that season of kids, the, the kids' ministry, the youth ministry are such an important role in their life as well where we want our kids, we should encourage our kids to be in those environments so that we can have other people speaking into their life as well. And so I just, I love it when, when guys say, hey, we're, we're, we're a church family. We're connected to church. We're going to church. I'm, my family's going to be involved in church because that sets the tone spiritually in the home. So those are the three ways God has called us to, to lead our family as a provider, as a protector, as a pastor. And as we step into that role and we do those things, guys, honestly, it feels good. It feels really good because that's how we're wired. You don't have to be perfect. Okay? You don't have to know everything. You just, just, just be who God has called you to be. Just step up, step in, and start trying, regardless of even how your wife responds. Maybe she starts trying to control and take, no, 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 no you're not doing it good enough, or whatever. Maybe she does encourage you. Regardless, I would encourage you just to keep doing the best you can. 
to lead. Do the best. I really believe this is the highest calling we have, is to lead our family spiritually in, in, in all these ways. So lead courageously, man. I encourage you with that. And for me, as I, as I pursue Christ with my life, my goal really is to bring my family with me. I want my, my, my wife to be closer to God because of our relationship. I want my kids to be closer to God because I'm in their life, because I happen to be their dad. And so I want to pull them closer to, to Christ as I'm pursuing him. So back to Ahab and Jezebel. Let's, let's just real quickly end this story here. So what's going on here is Jezebel, she's starting to control the situation. I'm going to get this piece of property for you. So here's what she does. She devises this evil plan. And we're going to go to verse 15 here and look at this. But she gets Naboth to a party, and she has two thugs accuse him of, uh, of cursing God and cursing the king, which is, you know, penalty of death. So they accuse him of cursing God and cursing the king, and then because of the accusations, they do kill him. Okay, Naboth doesn't do it, but they drag him out and they stone him to death. You know, what's interesting is you see, who does God hold accountable for this murder? Let's look at this here, verse 15. As soon as Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned to death, she said to Ahab, get up. He's still laying in bed apparently, just sulking, like just throwing a fit. Well, it was me, you know, I can't do anything, you know, I'm not going to eat, okay? Get up, you lazy husband of mine, and take possession of the vineyard, okay? Hey, some of you finished that sentence in a way you shouldn't have, all right? Okay, can I just be real? All right. <laughs> uh, this vision of Naboth, the, the Jezreelite, that he refused to sell you, he is no longer alive but dead. When Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, he got up and went down to take possession of Naboth's vineyard. Okay. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, the Tishbite. Okay, he's the prophet. Go down, God tells him, to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who rules in Samaria. He is now in Naboth's vineyard where he has gone to take possession of it. Say to him, this is what the Lord says. Have you not murdered a man and seized his property? Then say to him, this is what the Lord says. In the place where dogs licked up Naboth's blood, dogs will lick up your blood. Yes, yours. Yeah, that's kind of gross, isn't it? Kind of crazy right there. Okay. <laughs> so technically, who killed Naboth? Technically, it would be Jezebel. But who is God holding responsible for this? He is holding Ahab, the man, the husband, accountable for this. Husbands, it's important that we understand that God will hold us accountable. He will hold you and I accountable. It, this shows us how important our leadership role is. I believe any leadership is a stewardship. And so we have got to steward our role as husband and even as dad the best of our ability because God will hold us accountable to everything that we are stewarding. So let me encourage you again, guys, to step up and lead. Lead courageously. Do the best you can. How do you do that? How does that look? Well, let's go back to this verse that I read at the very, very beginning, Ephesians 5. Look at this verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And this, this verse really shows us how we can lead. It's just by following Jesus' example and just serve. Serve. Love. Love as much as you can. Love with your words. Love with your actions. And serve the best that you can. That's what Jesus did. To the extent that he gave up his life for his bride, the church, which is all of us. And so husbands were called to lead like that, self-sacrificially. We're considering other people, we're looking to them. It's not that we're all high and mighty, no, it's that we are called to lead the way in serving and looking to other people. I encourage you to do that. Ladies, I pray that God would use you to make a weak man stronger. And uh, gentlemen, I pray that God would use you to lead your family the way in the, in the place that God wants you to lead them to. Would you stand to your feet right now and let's pray. Lord, again, we, uh, we just thank you for your word and for how your word speaks to us and challenges us and convicts us. And Lord, I pray that we take these, these principles to heart today, all of us. And we would strive to pursue you and to glorify you with our lives our relationships, 
with our marriages. Lord, I pray for those that may be feeling like, man, I, I struggle with being too passive or those that are struggling with being too controlling. Lord, I pray that you'd help them to, to let go of those issues, to work on those issues and to grow through those issues. In fact, if, if you're here this morning, you'd say that Tyro and I, really for, for one of those really speaks to me and I really want to be intentional about growing through that and working through that. Just lift your hand right now. I just want to pray for you, okay? I'm too passive at times, Tyrone, or I'm too controlling at times. Just lift your hand. And right now we're going to go to God. God, help these people. Lord, you see our hands. Lord, you see you see all of us, Lord, being honest with you, saying that we struggle with, with one of these issues. God, I pray that you'd help us, Lord. Help us to be givers of grace, to be receivers of grace. Help us to be initiators and leaders and to step up and be who you've called us to be, Lord. I pray that because of this moment right here, that marriages would get stronger. The marriages would get healthier. Lord, that, that we would turn a corner in, in our marriages because of this decision, Lord, and you'd help keep bringing this into light. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.